Shalom, this is Avram Shira from Eretz Yisrael. It's Erev Shabbat. We've got about an hour to go, and we want to have a little talk here about something very special. The idea that Shabbat is a simulator of the world to come, a model, a paradigm, an example of the life of the soul without a body. Now, sometimes in this world it feels like we don't have a body, or it's not working too good. But Shabbat is really God's gift to give us a taste of what there is to come. It's a long creation. It's a long world. There's a lot that has to happen. And it begins, Shabbat hi bechinat olam haba, bechinat emet. The world to come is an aspect of Shabbat and of truth which tells us that these three concepts, Shabbat, the world to come, the future world, and truth, are all bound together. So when we talk about the future, we're talking about truth. When we're talking about Shabbat, we're talking about truth. And we're talking about the world to come, we're talking about Shabbat. And it works every which way, three, six different permutations of the concepts. Okay, what does that do for us? Well, it tells us, it gives us little portals little of understanding, little entryways to understand things by comparing to them to each other. That you can't have an idea of the world that's all Shabbat without truth. And you can't have truth without the idea of a time of rest. But it also, the Rebbe goes on to say, and through these three concepts, we come to a new idea. We draw down the fall of evil. And we reveal the true righteous people, the tzadikim amitim, the truly righteous, and then everything comes back to Hashem. And then the, the, the equation continues. This is the way Rabbi Nachman writes a lot of his Torahs, are like equations, concepts that build one after the other, leading to a, a high resolution. And after we come to this idea of re everything returning to God, and all of them, kulam b'shem Hashem, everyone is coming with the same idea of God. We no longer have religious wars. Now, wouldn't that be nice? You know, there's plenty of other things to fight about besides God. And certainly our concept of God is bound around the idea of peace. So why are we having wars about God? Why are people waging wars against each other about God? That's absurd. It's a contradiction of our definitions. And then he ends the, the piece... And through this, our speech, our holy speech, reaches completion of prayer. Okay, so now we're going to go back and take apart each rung of this ladder so that we can climb properly without being in danger. You know, when you climb on a ladder, you got to go easy, step by a time. Don't jump steps because it's dangerous. So Shabbat and the future world are all bound up with the idea of truth. Okay. Well, what is Shabbat? Shabbat is a time where we take a break. We take a rest. We focus on spiritual matters. We focus on family. We focus on festive meals. We sing songs. We make blessings. We talk Torah. We meditate. We pray. All the, really, the, the better things in life are coming together on Shabbat, in my opinion. Unless you just love going to work and staring at a screen for eight hours a day. I don't know. But the truth is that this Shabbat is also, it's not just the idea of not working, it's not, not the idea of not driving, of not uh, talking on my phone and all these things, but rather it's the idea of reaching a new consciousness of Hashem, that we get a new soul on Shabbat, and that new soul is not here just because it was taken from us at Mount Sinai when we made the golden calf, and now we get it back one week at a time. 
which is actually true according to the Kabbalah. However, the point of getting the Shabbos soul is that we can see ourselves in a higher light, in a holier light. And what happens? Well, what happens is, is you begin to praise things you don't normally take notice of. Then in Shabbat, you can actually, to pardon the cliche, you can smell the flowers. You can take time to appreciate what you have built in your life. You can take time to appreciate what other people are doing around you. And you can praise that. And you can have gratitude for what you have. Now, during the week, most people don't have time to breathe two slow breaths in a row. Ah, but it's so, it's so pleasant, you know, just to take a deep breath and let go of this week and this world and this run and this race. Okay, and then we can feel something nice and we have gratitude and praise. Guess what that leads to? Well, a certain amount of ecstasy, a certain amount of revelry, a certain amount of celebration. And this ecstasy brings us in touch with awe, this awe of everything as it really is. When you get used to things, it's very hard to feel awe. When you're used, you know, the first day you buy a new car, oh, it's awesome. You got a new car. Wonderful. <laughs> After a month, go talk to the guy. You know, it's not so awesome. It's just a car. So if, we, if our senses make us dull to the newness of physical things, how much easier is it to become dull to spiritual things which are not clearly in front of us until we actually make the effort to see them? So when you get to this idea of ecstasy and awe, then you open a book and you see things differently completely. You see the Torah from inside the Torah. You're no longer a human book being looking at a book, at ideas, at words. You're inside the Torah. You are part of it. It is part of you. It's another whole type of learning. When you learn that way, you don't care how much you learn or how fast you learn or what you learn. When you're learning from inside the Torah, it's all attached to the creator of the universe. Shabbat is a chance to make that kind of learning happen. Now, if you get up at 2 or 3 in the morning, it's a lot easier. Or whenever you can get up. But that type of learning where you are one with the Torah is, is really what we're made for. Because the Torah is the ultimate root of our soul. Why? Because the Torah is a set of commands. Well, in that case, it sounds like a program to me. It's the newest app. You know, the newest app is your soul. And that soul is filled with commands, just like any piece of software. And if those commands are all the will of God, then guess what you attach to when you attach to those commands? You're attaching to the will itself. And that will is an endless channel and stream that connects all of creation. God's will is not a disjointed thing, here and there, once in a while, connected, not connected. No, it's all one continuous flow from the beginning of time till now, from the beginning of space till now, and from the beginning of thought or intention. It's all one will. That's what we mean when we say, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. God is one at every level of measurement, of every level of perception. And you know, we have to compete, we have to repeat it about 50,000 times to get, <laughs> to remember and then when you have this type of learning from inside the Torah, then your knowledge is quantitatively different. Your, the knowledge that you gain changes you. It's not information anymore. It's, it's, it's will. You become part of the will. And it becomes part of you. And that's what Shabbat gives us. And when you become part of the will, then it, it, the idea of the world to come becomes very easy to, comp to comprehend. Because it is the place where... It's God's will. It's no longer that I have to worry about my boss's will and my wife's will and the, the tax man's will and all the other wills. No. In heaven, nobody's worried about those things. In heaven, nobody's worried about eating or what you're going to drink or what you're going to smoke or what you're, what you're going to wear. Or what, you know, The only thing you wear up there is your good deeds. And it's all tied to this idea of the will. And so, really, what we're doing in this world is we're refining our will. 
I have 10,000 things I want. I need to whittle those down to one. So there's 9,999 9, things that need to be whittled away. That takes time. It takes maybe a couple lifetimes. We can do it in one life if we're really dedicated. But when you attach to that level, then all of a sudden the whole thing fits together. You see the oneness in everything. You see the, the continuity of the physical and the spiritual. And you see how they're really bound together. The spiritual world is not somewhere else. It's here attached to the physical. We just don't see it. But when our senses get refined enough, then we can see it. And when we see it, all the arguments fall away. And all the suffering is sweetened. And we start to have this living faith. This faith that we are not here on this planet like a, a whirling prison in space. That we are here on this planet to build something even greater. And we're part of that. Okay, and... Now, the next concept that the Rebbe jumps to is, and then we see the fall of evil and evil people. Now, there's a difference between evil and evil people. Evil is an objective assignation. You define something as evil by its relation to everything else around it. In some cultures, it's evil to... kick a dog. <laughs> In other cultures, it's common. No one would think twice. So that's all relative, but there is an absolute concept of good. And of course, that absolute concept of good has to be built, connected to this idea of an absolute creator with a will. Otherwise, it all becomes what we call in Hebrew, hefker, without uh, intention, without an owner, without a, a a beginning, or a middle, or an end, and without something that's guiding that, with an agenda. When people think they remove God from the idea of an agenda, then you can do anything you want. And getting married or, get, or murdering somebody becomes, you know... So, we have to have this idea of evil, because there has to be ultimate good. Otherwise, there's no explanation at all for suffering. Now, evil people are people who have gone over the edge of the balance between the two sides of their soul. Every soul has a good inclination and a bad inclination. And it's like a continuum. You have 100% good at one end of the continuum and 100% evil at the other end of the continuum. And our soul is moving along this flow between ultimate good and ultimate evil. And we're all somewhere along that highway. Okay? And when we do a good deed, we add to that, we get closer to the ultimate good. And when we do the opposite, we get closer to the to the opposite, ultimate evil. So Roshayim are people who have done more so much evil that even the good that they have done has been overshadowed. They've left that part of the of the scale. And they've become, as the Rambam says, 51% or more evil. It doesn't mean there isn't good there. It just means the balance has been shifted. Now, there are people that can get to much greater levels, obviously. But we see that when we have Shabbat and truth and the idea of the future world, automatically evil people, they, they have no more power. Because what is the power of evil? It's the idea that truth is relative where truth, really there is an absolute truth, and then relative truth is our perspective of it. Then there's Shabbat, which is the idea of rest, that man is not here just to work and work and work until you die. And, of course, the idea of the world to come is really where we came from. And we want to go back there in better shape than we left much better shape. Okay, when you have those three concepts bound up, the evil people fall because they have nothing to hold on to. Because they want to take away those concepts. You need to work all the time at 
truth is relative to what I tell you, and the world to come is a big fantasy created by the, the religious uh, fantasy makers back in the Middle Ages or whenever they think that it was the concept was evolved. But when you believe in those concepts, they have no power over you. And then they fall. And then what happens is you see the real greatness of the people who have faith. The righteous, the tzaddikim. And then the real leaders, the really true good people are revealed. And you know, the world is filled with good people. But what the evil people want is that you don't notice that. Evil people want you to notice them. And of course, they want to hide and act like they're good. But the world is filled with good people. Except they don't get any legs. They don't get any traction because the media is interested in, in, in selling newspapers and, 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 and hits on, on YouTube. So they're always printing up the bad stuff. Because that's what sells. Because part of our, our negative side is the curiosity to know about evil. But that's not from our good side. And they know that, and they sell us that. And they package it very nicely. And they make it very easy. You can spend 24-7 on your phone seeing all the evil things that people do and never stop. Now, what kind of life is that? But when you have that veil removed from your eyes and you see the goodness in things and the goodness in truly righteous people, ah, Everything returns to this idea of Shem Hashem, the, the true reputation of God. That even if we speak different languages and we have different religions and we're from different continents, we understand there's one creator and there's one goodness. And we get along. And we have a good time together. And we talk about it. Look on this show. We've got, we've got people from Cameroon, from Nigeria, from New York, from California, all over the world. We're all speaking about one thing with one God and one idea in mind. That's already a fulfillment of this. Everything returns to this primordial singular idea. Before religion. Isn't that funny? God was before religion. <laughs> but we need religion because it, it's, it's the only type of instruction that we have that's going to get us back to that original oneness to see it and to live it and to be part of it most people spend their lives as spectators of the world and even religious people spend their lives as spectators of god forgetting that god is inside you he's inside your eyes and inside your breath and inside your speech well we just don't see it because of the thickness of the of the klipot of the layers of that are clouding perception And when we come back to this singular idea of one reputation, God is good, he is righteous, he's merciful, and he's patient, and he wants everybody's good. Not just your good versus my good. He wants both of our goods. And he wants a Muslim's good, and he wants a Jew's good. And he wants a Christian's good, and he wants a Coptic's good. So we just have to agree that there is this concept, this idea. Shame is shame. The, revel the revelation of a singular reputation. And through this, this is a very interesting phrase, Nishlam dibor de Kedusha. The holy speech becomes complete. We're no longer speaking like they did before the flood in different languages. We're speaking one language, one understanding. Now, it doesn't mean that I, I say father and you say padre and you say pater. No, it's not, we're not talking about that level of oneness of language. We're talking about the oneness of intentionality, the oneness of understanding. And that's Dibor de Kedusha, the speech that brings you closer to your truth, which is, of course, the ultimate truth. Now, when our speeches reach this level of completion, where their racism becomes like a joke, it becomes ridiculous. It's like children arguing about baseball. Racism, 
What's racism? Your skin, your background, the country you were born in? That's Debord de Kedusha. That's holy speech. Whether it doesn't even occur to you to look down at somebody because of those kind of things. Now, if someone does evil, you're supposed to feel sorry for them. Because they're trapped in that continuum on the wrong side of the scale. And we're supposed, Rabbi Nachman teaches, we're supposed to judge even the evil people to favor. Now, there are in the 613 mitzvot of the Rambam, there is a mitzvah not to judge the mesit to favor. The mesit is someone that leads people away from God, chiefly, usually to themselves. They make themselves into God, like Pero and a few other religions, a few other cults out there. A mesit is someone who takes people away from the truth. That person, we're not allowed to judge him to favor. But every other Russia person is involved with theft or, or lust or all the other things that people fall into. We're just supposed to have mercy for them. Now, it doesn't mean I let them. I have to have them in my house. It doesn't mean I have to, to do business with them. But I have to think of them in terms of their highest good. Because that will help reveal it. And these are big challenges, and I'm not holding that I'm there. You know, I'm working on it with you. We're all in this together. People always like to bring up the name of Hitler, you know, ultimate evil. Yes, he reached ultimate evil, but I, I don't know if he started out that way. But he was overwhelmed. And the events of his life challenged him to become ultimate evil. And great things, greatly terrible things happened. Okay. We'll be doing a class, a special class on the Holocaust in the right time and in the right place to understand. According to the Kabbalah, when you understand the Kabbalah, you understand the Holocaust. Now, it doesn't mean you want to accept it. Most people just can't even hear it. But these teachings are bound into the teachings of the Arizal. He gives us the basic headlines, and we have to understand. We'll get there. But for now, we're reaching this level of Dibor de Kedusha, holy speech. It's not that everybody's speaking Hebrew. <laughs> or everybody has one of these, you know, these, these translators buzzing in my ear. No. It means we're all speaking the same language of understanding. One God, one will, one goodness for all. Now, it's in the Ten Commandments, but that's Ten Commandments, not one. But the, rab the rabbis say, no, I'll tell you what, all the Ten Commandments are in the First Commandment and in the last one. The First Commandment, I am God. Know that I am God. So we all need to know that. And the Last Commandment is Al-Tachmod. Don't lust. Don't covet. Don't want things at all. Now, it doesn't mean I don't want a new Shabbos hat. I want, you know, <laughs> a good meal etc. No, it means I don't want things in excess, more than the measure necessary provided for in any situation. And covet usually means I want something that you have, and that creates all the problems. All right, and when we reach this holy speech where everybody understands, has this unified vision, then Prayer itself reaches shlemut. yesh Prayer is in completion. Now, what is complete prayer? Well, it's when we're all praying together for the same goodness. That selfishness falls away. That your good and my good is the same good. And neither good has to suffer because of somebody else's. You know, it's like when, when everybody, you know, you're in third grade and everybody runs to the line in the cafeteria to get your hamburger first. Wow. Is that really what it's about? We have to have a little bit of faith 
that if God can make seven or eight billion people, he can make eight billion hamburgers. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. But really, when we have that idea in prayer that your good is my good and that I'm praying for all good, then guess what? That's completion of prayer. And then we make God happy that he created us. Now that seems to be a worthwhile goal. Because after looking back at my own life and at the things that I didn't do that were according to God's will, like it would be nice to think I could still make God happy. That he created me. And we should all have that blessing and that sense, that feeling. I just want to make God happy. You know, that he created humanity. Because there's so many reasons why we would say, wow, why did God create humanity? Look at the mess we made. But that can all be fixed very quickly. Very quickly. Okay. So I hope these ideas are useful. Certainly they're transformative if we take them to heart inside. If we work them over, the truth, Shabbat, and the future world are all bound together. That means when you live a real spark of truth, you're living a real spark of the world to come. And, and then when you experience Shabbat, you're experiencing those other two ideas as well. And then they lead us up this ladder of concepts all the way to where humanity is actually the unified being that it's supposed to be. Whether it takes a day or a thousand years, it doesn't matter. We have to do the work because this is the only work. <laughs> it is the only thing that makes this whole cosmic game make a lot of sense and it's not a game it is the ultimate reality and we're living it and it's inside us so check us out this week we should we should be teaching again live on facebook of course you can go to youtube we have movies and classes over there go to our website there's writing over there I'm putting out some chapters of a book i'm doing there's video poems there's essays there's all kinds of stuff to check out. And, and on Patreon, you can become a member to have a daily class every day. And we can talk and write to each other and have a direct connection at a level that hopefully we, we all benefit. So have a great Shabbat, wherever you are, wherever whatever you're doing. Give yourself a break. Give yourself that day off. Tell your boss, I need a day off. You know, I need a day for, for my soul. I need a day for my family and for my true self. Because we're not just here to work. I'm sorry. I was 10 years old and I said, it can't be that we're just here to work, eat, go to sleep and get up and do it again. You know, we're not here for that. All of that is just the manginon in Hebrew. It means that's the machine trying to tell us that that's all there is, but it's not. So enjoy the Shabbat. Enjoy your time for yourself and your family. We'll look for you next week with more of these wonderful ideas from the Kabbalah, and from Rabbi Nachman, and from other sages, because they gave us this so we could do this together, and God gave us Facebook and the Internet so we could do it all over the world together. God bless. Shabbat Shalom.